Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So this is what we are going to look at uh, the what we call the grip framework. In other words what we did so far is to map the ecosystem and for the four uh, parts of the ecosystem we have studied what are all the what are all the possible factors that are affecting the supply chain and why is the supply chain inefficient. So, let us look at uh, the four factors. The first one is GRIP stands for governance, risk, innovation and performance. So, but as I said although this is a good acronym we are going to study in the reverse order we, we, we start with the performance. So, SES framework help us to study the following or the food supply chain governance and so on and the food supply chain design design avoiding social political risks using innovations in regulations and logistics. So, let us look at the performance. What is the state of Indian food sector? Let us do uh, the SWOT analysis. So, if you look at what are the strengths of Indian food sector, vast natural resources, we have seen that. 52 percent of land can to above uh, water there are 16 seasons and all that. There is an established farming system. Yes, you need not have to start it afresh and so on. It is a growing economy because of services growth and so on and supporting government policies. The government is doing uh, it as the agriculture uh, uh, SC jets. It provides a lot of subsidies, fertilizer subsidy. Um, and so on. It allows uh, foreign direct investment and it is a vital outsourcing hub. It is an outsourcing hub for other than agriculture products. In other words, it, uh, there is a lot of manufacturing uh, involved, there is a lot of services which are which come to in India and so on. So, when it become an outsourcing hub for the other products, manufacturing products and services, can it become an outsourcing hub for providing food to others? I mean of course, there are lots of uh, exports that uh, happen in the agriculture products and so on. So, let us look at what are the weaknesses. Small scale conventional farm, primitive post harvest methods, no channel master and many farmers to consumers intermediaries hardly any food processing industry, inadequate storage and performance. So, basically we are we have summarized earlier and we are looking at in the performance the weaknesses of this. So, here small scale primitive post harvest methods and so on. So, basically some of them need to be taken taken out by researchers, by companies and by educational institutions and some of these weaknesses are to be business oriented. In other words, there is no way in which anybody can help. You have to allow contract farming, but contract farming people are afraid that the small farmers may be uh, because of their weakness, they can be commoditized by the these people. What are the consequences? What are the consequences of the strength weaknesses, these weaknesses? Surplus food is wasted away. <coughs> in other words, uh, there is an article by me, can India be the food basket for the world? The answer is yes. Can India supply the food <coughs> for all the 6 billion people of the world? The answer is yes. But we are wasting away the 30 percent of the food and the farmer gets only 20 percent of uh, 25 percent of the final price inefficient supply chain, no not meeting the young consumer preferences. Uh, preferences. You know 
if you, if you look at India, it is 50 percent of the population is below 25 years, 50 percent of the population is below 25 years. So, the youngers or aspirations are they want protein rich food, they do not want, uh, they do not want to eat the grains. So, are you meeting the aspirations of these young people? The answer is no. So, what are the opportunities? The opportunities are for cold chain management infrastructure builders, processed food manufacturers, food packaging and logistics providers, food retailers and exporters. IT and data analysts and research institutions. There is huge opportunity that provides Indian food sector and so on. So, finally, potential to become leading food supplier for the whole world, not only for India. So, this is where I was telling that India has the comparative advantage to become a leading food supplier for the entire world but we are not and it is very important that uh, uh, that this should be taken seriously. So, if you look at the benchmarking of the Indian food supply chain. So, as I said one of the things that you can use the SES framework is for benchmarking. So, if you want to benchmark what about the resources, they are high resources and what about how much of them you are using, your management your management is very low, inefficient and fragmented. Resources are abundant, but so if you look at the resources, God is great. He has been very kind to India, but the man is basically does not know how to manage. And if you look at the supply chain, there are too many intermediaries and in it could be a lot better than what it is today. We have seen that from our analysis. What about product offering in terms of product, few product, uh, processed fats and so on. So, this products offering are, are very less in India. In other words, you do not have as many products as you could, you could get from uh, the, uh, the processed industry. Then what about information technology, using information, internet and in the supply chain? There is hardly any information transfer, it is all only uh, either the phone calls or uh, face to face communication that happens. What about the logistics? In terms of we are talking of the connecting technologies or delivery technologies, both information technology and logistic technology are at the low as far as this is concerned. And what about economic integration and trading? There are lots of protectionist economic policies, APMC Act and so on and all this minimum price act and so on, these acts are acting against this. And also what about uh, packaged uh, duties and high? In other words, as far as the trade is concerned, it is not very friendly. So, what happens is if you, if you look at the benchmarking in Indian, Indian this one that shows the performance of the Indian supply chain. This diagram is shows you the, uh, the performance of the Indian uh, supply chain. So, there are inefficiencies in the about 30 percent of all foods produced in India are wasted. The producer's shares in the domestic consumers retail is 25 percent, it is about 50 percent in the domestic market. In other words, out of 20, 75 percent of what the consumer pay, you and I pay, it goes to the intermediaries, to the uh, to others, to the logistics and retailers and so on. Only 25 percent of food grains use modern storage facilities, 75 percent of them are stored on the road. Annual poor post harvest losses are estimated to be 10 percent of total food grain production. India produces a wide range of both tropical and temperature fruits and vegetables and is the world's largest producer, but less than 2 percent of production is processed, 25 percent is stored as wastage. In other words, if you supposing you take uh, something like tomatoes or you take bananas, bananas can use drying technologies 
and they can be mixed in breakfast cereals and so on. And that is those technologies are known in by by other companies. You need not have to invent any new technologies. They are known to the world. Only thing is you have to basically use those technologies in the Indian context. And so only less than 2 percent of the production is processed and 25 percent is lost in the wastage. Warm tropical climate, high temperature and high humidity conditions make clone chain mandatory. So, if you think you can manage without the cold chain, it becomes extremely unwise, it will be extremely unwise. So, the inefficiencies in the food sector, in the, you know, they come from, from this. So, if you are looking at the performance of this, that is what the performance tells us. In other words, if you are looking at the performance of uh, the food sector, then we have we have used the SCS framework to map the uh, to the the on the on the for this one, and that particular diagram is useful if you want to. Most of the times, most of the times, you want to know you know the supply chain is inefficient. So so what? How do I rectify this? So, this diagram gives you where you should be able to rectify it. In other words, if you are in the government decision maker, then you should look at this. If you are in the want to have the delivery service infrastructure, you should look at this. If you are looking at the manufacturing and the supply chain, you should look at the supply chain inefficiencies and also food manufacturing sector and so on. So, one of the advantages that we have what the SES framework, the supply chain ecosystem framework is. You, once you know where the efficiencies are, you know who the decision makers are and who should address this problem. The resources are there and then the resource management is an issue. Who should address this? The government need to, uh, to train the people in terms of the skills and so on. The educational institutions should also do this, uh, the, the, the skill based training and somebody has to develop the, the material for this training, who should be trained and in what direction they should be trained and what should they be trained and so on. So, basically the issue is once you have this performance in this, you, you know the, where the decision rests and who should take the initiatives and so on. So, we will look at uh, the, uh, the innovation and what are the innovations that are possible? I mean one thing that happens here since our analysis has earlier shown that the Indian supply chain, food supply chain is, is weak. So, it is possible to make the Indian food supply chain competitive by borrowing several concepts from other supply chains as well as food supply chains in other countries. So, this is where we are going, I am saying that the supply chain can benefit from new to the market kind of initiatives and so on. You need not have to invent very much in terms of those. So, innovations along four dimensions need to converge for Indian food retail to turn into highly competitive vertical. They are basically the supply chain innovations, institutions, resources, logistics and IT and so on. So, we call this SCS framework for excellence in innovation. So, why are innovation policies needed? As I said, the traditional science policy is scientific discovery and invention followed by commercialization. That is the linear logic where you, you have to first find out, the, uh, discover the product and then you have to file a patent and afterwards commercialize it and so on. But what we need here is to include both the new to the market as well as new to the world of innovation. So, we require that kind of innovations, the science the new traditional innovations. But what we urgently need for India is the other wider innovations. So, innovations in management like outsourcing and innovations in institutions like social policy, deregulation and governance need to be incorporated. And science, technology, engineering, 
regulations and policy and management contribute to innovations in services and determine the sector's competitiveness. For example, in, in the food supply chain, we saw that there is no governance at all. It's everything is left to the individuals and if he does not, does not know what to sell and where to sell, then, then he is lost. So, let us look at what are the innovations in food supply chain. Actually, I will give you a big list and afterwards go into to particulars of them. For example, I was talking of seed to feed agriculture. In other words, depending on the particular product you are looking at, can you seed that for that? For supposing you are using corn, supposing your end product is corn oil, then can you use a seed which will give you high high oil, oil this one for this from the feed. Supposing your final end product is for for food, use it in a, in a, as, a, as, a, as a vegetable, then in such a case you want it high nutrition. So, can you make it so use a seed which will make it highly nutritious? So, in other words, depending on the feed, can you use the seed? So, that is called seed to feed agriculture and the answer in, in case of corn is yes, but can you, uh, can you extend this to other uh, this one? So, put, I mean they are trying to do something of a uh, uh, sweet potatoes and all that, they want to increase the, the vitamin A content in this, they have the seeds for that particular thing. And about food processing, protein rich food, nutritious food at affordable, accessible and awareness created for all sections of the population. So, you have to have nutritious food, nutritious food is different from food. You have to have, you know, India has these malnutrition kids and, and uh, uh, pregnant mothers and so on. So, for them, if we want to provide nutritious food, there are triple A qualities that you need to provide. One is it should be affordable. Well, people are poor. So, even though it is nutritious, if, it, if you provide at a very high cost, then you may not be able to this one. It should be accessible. In other words, if they are in a village, they cannot come to the side, to the town and then buy it. So, it should be available in the village and awareness. It can be good, but it should taste well and then people should be aware that if they eat this, they are getting vitamins and so on. It is good for their health. And low cost, high quality food, certified food like halal, organic, store formats, home delivery, e-retail, international market through JVs and so on and market channel innovations, joint inventory management, CPFR, RFID, category management, operational and innovation and outsourcing. So, if you are a supply chain guy, these are all the things that are done usually for all the supply chains in foreign countries. In other words, you do joint inventory management, so, but in the retail, but with jointly with your wholesaler or jointly with your manufacturer. And you have to have this category management and operational innovation, outsourcing and so on. And regulatory innovations like green, customs for perishable goods, trade, hygiene, regulations on packaging, formulations, pricing, procurement like APMC Act, Essential Commodities Act, minimum support for PDS. I mean, they are all this one, supposing they regulate all this, that is going to affect the food supply chain, particularly these regulatory innovations. For example, VAT is value added tax. For example, the government is trying to remove the restrictions for interstate transfer. So, the interstate as transfer is going to affect the logistics a lot. Now, warehouse location becomes lot more friendly and also it will reduce lot of logistics costs if, it, if, the, if this uh, uh, VAT is comes into force. Delivery service technologies, cold chain, packaging, manual, less manual handling, sensor networks for visibility, delivery with bad infrastructure. This is if you can innovate how to deliver on time 
when even if the infrastructure is bad. What is bad infrastructure? You do not have good roads, you do not have very timely transport and so on. So, how do you, what are the innovations that are possible? Distribution backbone and product recalls and all that. Now, particularly when you are dealing with food, if the food gives, for example, the food poisoning and so on, then it may be necessary to advise the, uh, the customers not to use that food. Well, it may not be need to need to have product recall here, it could be asked them to dump it. So, but even then you should be able to reach the customers who have bought that particular food. So, you should be able to have a communicate with the with your customers. And resources and resource management, water, power, post harvest research, food clusters, food course, product development and testing labs and talent. You see, one of the big innovations that can come in food supply chain is do you want to supply the grains? Do you want to supply the grains like rice, wheat and fresh vegetables and so on or do you want to supply the food which is nutritious, which is cooked, which is fresh at affordable prices? So, this is like do you want to supply the product or do you want to supply the solution? Now, all of us know where in various varieties of uh, manufacturing industries, people look at the solution as well as the products. In food supply chain, it makes lot of sense to look at the solutions that is supplying the food rather than the grains. That is where the food clusters, food cores and so on, they basically play a big role here. If you develop food courts and and at those food courts, if you give ration for people who are buying, for a ration card holders, food courts give food at discount and the food here is hygiene food and it is basically standardized and it is nutritious, then you are solving both the problems. So, the people you need to have to, then do you have food courts everywhere? They are hawkers, hawkers are small food courts and so on. So, the resource here is uh, it could, you could you could manage and innovate something. So, there is the seed to feed value, value driven agriculture. There is the farmer is unaware of the market, crops something and tries to sell the mandi and to an agent and expects a fair price and so on. We have seen this before, but the kind of scenario is supply driven. So, desirable scenario is basically you do sales to the right customers to the maximum in the market. In other words, final the farmer crops to the market. Now, this is possible for example, a farmer which who crops cotton and he has to sell it to the factories to the garment factories and the garment factories could be in somewhere in the west and the farmer could be somewhere in the east. So, how do you communicate between them? So, basically are you are you producing a particular uh, factory for this and so on. So, if the farmer is able to connect, then he need not have to have problems later. Need to transform the way agriculture works. And food product market estimation. See, one of the problems with uh, processed food as we have seen earlier is the duties. In other words, for packaging is very expensive. The duties on packaged food is very expensive. That is where orange juice costs so much and so on. But on the other hand, on the other hand, if the if the government as well as the people or the the, the industry, they come together and Estimate the market right. How many people will buy orange juice packets if it is cheap as coffee or tea on the roadside stall and costs only 5 rupees? Of course, 5 rupees it can be 10 rupees because coffee now costs 10 rupees. So, basically, if you can estimate your market instead of uh, the orange juice being priced at 50 rupees, if it is priced at 10 rupees, and then if it is supplied on the road in a good condition, hygienic then do you buy coffee or do you buy orange juice 
orange juice can be can be bought and it is useful if it is nutritious when the pregnant women and children they will get into the malnutrition problems will will disappear so if you estimate your market you have basically 1.2 billion people and orange juice can be drink can be can can be used by from small kids to the old people so you have a market of 1.2 billion every day or every week but because of this what happens there is a reduction in the disease burden in other words there are more people will not get sick will not get will be more healthy the children will not be a burden on the society because of malnutrition and so on so and the government can subsidize uh, part of it as a as a part of its this one is to giving hospitals later when they get the disease so the food market estimation is uh, becomes an important thing and um, we have seen this kind of market estimation is now uh, is an innovation in by the industry in terms of this one this has been done uh, with with a lot of success in the telephone industry in india so the other one is how to achieve a standing break growth so don't ever start uh, thinking uh, that the only way to sell food uh, sell is, is the grains sell value chains not products in other words you sell the final solutions and uh, also the whole process start by asking what should be the scale of operation to support low enough prices required to spur a higher growth and penetration of packaged food market as of now packaged food market in india is is very expensive very few people can afford it but can the packaged food be used by everybody the answer is big yes it is by the both poor as well as the, as well as the uh, rich people can use the packaged food but then the market will increase enormously if you can bring down the prices if you can make it more nutritious more affordable so that's the kind of thing that industry breakout growth that industry should think about and what are the opportunities you know, for example as i said before india can be a hub a food hub instead of trying to be a low car hub a low cost hub or a it service hub and so on since it has all the natural resources and it can create huge employment if india follows the food manufacturing there are huge opportunities halal hub now for example the india has a muslim population about 200 million and it is neighbors our export to southeast asia and and middle east and so on we have indonesia we have malaysia we have all the middle east country middle east and countries you can if there there are the halal hub if you it is halal food is exported then uh, it becomes an export hub vegetarian hub a lot of indians are vegetarians so it can be vegetarian hub organic food hub europe and usa and seafood hub because there are lots of sea population so if it is developed in an industrial scale and using the natural resources and appropriate this one is done india has a huge opportunity to become a halal hub a vegetarian hub organic food hub and a seafood hub so food processing smes in rural india if you create for example in the rural india how do you pro, how do you supply a uh, uh, food process processed food to the rural india you create food processing smes in rural india you know for making tomatoes to this one and so on and the distribution system need to be improved cold chain management post harvest technologies we went through this and potential for huge employment creation now for example the distribution system the logistics is is a skilled uh, uh, appropriate skill training people can be logistics employer similarly in cold chain similarly in post harvest uh, this one similarly in food processing these are all don't require a phd is kind of thing all that they require is uh, is skill training so if they are done skilled 
if it's skill trained appropriately, then they can they can provide uh, this one. So the the food manufacturing opportunities and with huge uh, employment potential. Uh, other than that, it will also improve the efficiency of the food. So then another thing that comes is, is this, I mean there is the people are talking about what is called big data analytics or a big data analysis in agriculture. What is big data? Big data is the data that is available to you uh, when you want to make a decision. In the agriculture, you have to make decisions on depending on your soil fertility, depending on the weather patterns that are going to come, you have to make what is the kind of seed, what is the crop that you want to have, when do you want to seed and when do you want to harvest and what is the kind of post harvest research and so on. So, this depends on meteorological data, hydrology, surface, uh, subsurface water budget and meteorology, uh, atmospheric conditions and pedology, soil type and condition and phenology is biological stages of plant development. So, this basically you can do the advice, I mean at the, at the appropriate moment based on uh, all these sciences, I mean these are, these are well developed sciences, the only thing is these people should be able to advise the farmers in this. And weather model, precipitation, humidity, temperature, wind and so on, depending on the crop you are in, do the temperatures affect your crop, the quality and so on. And soil moisture, soil temperature and evaporation. And advice for field preparation, sowing, weeding, irrigation, harvesting and chemical application. So, you are basically, the only way agriculture research is just seed and watering and so on, basically it is practice oriented. Now from practice oriented agriculture, you have to convert it to scientific agriculture. Now the scientific agriculture is nowadays is basically data based decision making and this needs to come into India. So, this is called big data analysis which is used in retail markets. For example, uh, in, uh, in retailing, there are lots of disruptive changes. Retailers, Indian retailers you want to use any of this can gain an understanding how shoppers move around the stores, where they go, in what order, how long they stay and when they come to the store and how all these questions map to actual sales. So, are people just coming to sightsee or they are going to buy? What are the places they are visiting and then how they are I mean these are done by through CCTV cameras and, and so on and all these things and also the point of sale information. Using all this you can combine who are the good customers, who are, what are they doing, what are their behavior. Retailers need to develop predictive models for this price discounting, advertising and coupon. In other words, if they want to get coupons and price discounts and so on depending on what who is buying. Forecasting based on past data, batch size calculation using square root formula and being replaced by real time visibility and delivery on demand. In olden days in the supply chain, even today some people do this, they basically look at how do you calculate what should be your demand. In other words, how do you fill your shelves? How much do you order from your warehouse? How much should you order from the manufacturer and so on? All that used to be done by past sales. It is a past thing. What you do today is your delivery on demand and it is real time visibility. You look at what people are buying and make choice. It can be online buying if you are doing online online retailing, e-retailing as it is called, then you know, then it becomes even more this one that uh, these, uh, these disruptive changes are going to affect this. Now, for example, there are technology platforms uh, that you should develop technology platform, track connections between people, 
products, brands and use this to make product recommendations to the customers. You know one thing that happens uh, in most advanced countries which our retailer should learn is that whenever you go to the web and then try look for a camera, look for a laptop, look for a cell phone or something, then you immediately start getting emails from various people saying that look we have this available, we have that available, we can give this to you, give you this at a discount, you go to this store then you know it is less price, this kind of stuff. But when you are, of course in India 60 percent of, of this is food, even then you know uh, do you get an email or do you, do you have this one, uh, some retailing invitations saying that the, the, here we are having this kind of food, please come and buy and so on. So the communication with customers become, should be become a habit, I mean they should start with the middle class and it should, can go down later. So, you another problem that uh, with, we have with uh, uh, this one in the delivery, this one is integrated distribution centers. In other words, do you have distribution centers? In India, we have 7,000 warehouses. Logistics back, back one for India is uh, we do not have distribution. Distribution center location, design and operation, architecture, transportation scheduling, green shared IT and logistics resources built up under PPP, PPP is private public partnership. In other words, it is very important for India to, to innovate distribute center locations. Where do you locate distribution centers? What are distribution centers? Distribution centers with the places where you store your, your items and then they are sent to the retailers when as and when they are required and the distribution centers consist of warehouses, trucks and so on and all that. You know it has the, uh, it has um, transportation, it can be green and uh, so on and all that. But what happens is in India we have only warehouses not distribution centers. So in India, the, the, the warehouses are basically either for FMCG or from white goods and so on. Depending on the product type, you have five, five, seven thousand warehouses and so on in India. But what are needed are the distribution centers, which are integrated into this. And plant locations are now at the forks, are not at the hubs, creating outbound logistics problem. In other words, where are you having your uh, your auto factories, they are in Delhi, Chennai and uh, uh, Calcutta and Pune, Bombay and so on. So they are the forks, they are not at the hubs. What is the hub of India? Probably Nagpur, probably Hyderabad, probably anywhere in the middle of this one. If you have production settlements, you should go to the forks. But we have it at the forks and they, there we have the reverse logistics. In other words, we had to transport finished goods rather than parts. Usually the transportation should happen. You transport the parts to the places where there is the, there is the, uh, where there is uh, a demand. So trucks and other moving equipment and manufacture, these are parts of the integrated distribution. This one, one need to do this. Innovate how efficiently use the existing infrastructure. Take advantage of the vast network and logistics capabilities of the existing institutions such as post office, road transport, banks, etc. to bring host of services to the rural population. Do not wait the infrastructure and so on. The grip framework as I said uh, for the in the ecosystem, this one is the G stands for governance, R stands for risk. I stands for innovation and P stands for performance. <coughs> Although GRIP is an acronym that we are using, we will uh, consider these things in the reverse order. As I said, we have already done, looked at the performance of the Indian food supply chain and then we looked at the innovations that are, uh, that are possible in the food supply chain and these are basically the new to 
the market kind of innovations rather than new to the world kind of innovations. In other words, these are not scientific or product discoveries and patenting and all that, but these are discoveries which are present in other parts of the world and they have made blockbuster industries, they have been very successful in terms of uh, the customer usage and all that. So, the third one which is an important one is the risk in the supply chain in, in the Indian food supply chain. The first and fundamental risk is the food alter adulteration getting deadlier by the day. You know, for example, unscrupulous dairy farmers invented synthetic milk, a deadly cocktail of urea, caustic soda and vegetable oil. You know, this will, this will cause food poisoning to cancer, any of this and causes lot of deaths. Now, I do not know why they do it, but uh, it looks like natural milk and I do not know who made this invention. And second one is fruits, particularly mangoes, are ripened using calcium carbide. What they do is they take the raw fruits and then spray calcium carbide on them and try to ripen. And but they, 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 this will look look very very nice for looking. Uh, but there are reports of uh, fish being appear fresh with the formalin and so on. But when the calcium carbide or formalin with this, they will cause food poisoning. The adult trans calcium carbide and formalin are banned and are known to be toxic. Some of them are carcinogenous or cancer causing substances and they will certainly cause uh, food poisoning and, uh, and ulcers and all that, but can also cause cancer. So, one thing the food adulteration and contamination is very common, uh, it is throughout the world, it is more prevalent uh, in emerging markets like India, but that is one of the highest risks that the food uh, supply chain faces. How do you counter this? I mean, how do you actually find out the trace the supply chain back and how do you find out that, uh, you know, they are, they, there is basically uh, adulterated, they are not, uh, they are not fresh and genuine goods. So, these are all the issues that the supply chain faces and it is very important this issue is addressed. The other one is the bird flu, you know, for example, the bird flu uh, the outbreaks around the world, uh, China, India and so on. I mean, this shows all the uh, countries with outbreaks uh, including the human cases are the red ones, China and so on and the countries with outbreaks without human are India, Iran, and Egypt and Nigeria and so on. So, I mean, what happens with the bird flu outbreaks? So, birds basically are the ones uh, you know, chicken and others, they are used as meat uh, in the food and once the, the virus or uh, is in the meat, then it can go to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the humans and thereby causing an outbreak. So, this is where I think one has to be extremely careful and uh, because the poultry managers who are uh, basically make the keep the, uh, the 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 poultry and the animals, they should be advised or uh, trained to find out if their birds are having bird flu. Most of the time, uh, people, the farmers or the uh, the poultry owners, before they realize that uh, there is a there is a bird flu with their uh, uh, contingent, then it breaks out. So there is a there is a need for educating the farmers on this. Similar is H1 and other communication communicable diseases which go through the the food channel. For example, the pet food is another issue that uh, this one. I mean, most of this uh, meat that is with the bird flu and all that it enters the pet flu and enters the pets and through them to the humans and all that. So, this becomes highly connected issue. 